In 2006, Ken Robinson gave my all-time favorite TED Talk when he asked the question, do schools kill creativity? Today, I want to ask another question. Have we allowed high-stakes testing to kill teacher autonomy? I'd like to share with you my journey in discovering the answer to that question and give a little advice to those great teachers out there who find themselves on a daily basis having their autonomy challenged. You see, teaching is an art form, and it's in my blood. From a very early age, I knew that that's what I wanted to be. In fact, as a young girl, at the end of each school year, I would ask my teachers for the leftover workbooks and worksheets, and they would give them to me. So I would come home with this huge stack of what my mother would call junk, but I called my curriculum. And for the next two and a half months of summer vacation, I would line up all my teddy bears on the couch, and I would teach. I would teach those bears everything that I had learned that year in school. But I didn't teach in the way that my teachers had taught me. You see, I would create songs and chants. I would imagine my bears doing projects. I didn't realize it at the time, but what I had in that moment was total autonomy. I had the freedom to make decisions and choices for my students. I could do anything that would make the learning engaging for my students and teaching fun and exciting for me. I was a teacher. So you can imagine my excitement when many years later I finally graduated college and secured my first teaching position. I always knew that I wanted to work with the students who I felt needed me the most. So I took a job in a large urban school district hundreds of miles away from the small country town in which I'd grown up. I was excited to be a teacher. I was even more excited when I got my first class list and I saw that I only had 15 students on my roster. Fifteen. Now, I knew from all my years of college that a 15 to 1 student-teacher ratio was darn near perfect, especially for such a large school district. So I was excited, confident, maybe a little overconfident. After all, I went to school for this. I just knew this was going to be the greatest first year of teaching of all time. <laughs> Within the first two weeks of school, those 15 students made me rethink my whole career plan. You see, I wasn't prepared. When I say sit, they'd stand. When I say don't talk, they talk a little louder. When I say don't fight, they fight. When I say, oh, no cursing in this classroom, they would string together a series of expletives that would put any sailor to shame. You see, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared to teach students who came to school hungry, who left school just as hungry. Students whose mothers worked as prostitutes at the abandoned car wash across the street from the school. Students who would come in and describe in vivid detail the body that had been found in the dumpster of their apartments the night before. I wasn't prepared. And as many people who are unprepared, I lost it one day. My kids were out of control. They were talking, and I was trying to get their attention. And again, I'm ashamed to say that I lost it. And so I raised my voice in this moment of frustration, and I yelled at my kids, and I said, shut up and let me teach. And in that moment, the room fell silent, as if the air had been sucked out of the room. And they all looked up at me and pointed. And in unison, they said, ooh, you said a bad word? And I thought to myself, you've said a whole lot worse. How dare you question my moral turpitude? But I knew I was wrong instantly. I knew I was wrong, and so I apologized to my students. But I learned a couple of things that day. I could get their attention, because they were quiet for a moment. But I also learned that shut up is a bad word in the elementary classroom. It's something that should never be said to anyone, especially not to kids. So I was wrong. However, I also learned that up until that moment, I thought it was my kids who were keeping me from teaching. 
You see with their bad behavior, their low performance, their apathy towards school. When in all actuality, it was me. You see, that joy that I felt as a little girl, it wasn't there. As a new teacher, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was just trying to survive. And so what frequently would happen is that my veteran teachers would bring me some materials and they would say, this is what we're teaching next week, here's how you can teach it, go. And so I would take this work and I would try to teach it to my students in the way that I thought these teachers wanted me to teach. You see, I thought I didn't have any autonomy. But it wasn't until I started to change things around and do things in different ways. I started researching my kind of student, and I realized what are the things that I needed to do to reach them so that I could teach them. It wasn't just that they were bad kids. They were just different than I was used to. So I had to learn how to deal with them and effectively teach them. And when I did, things started to slowly turn around. At the end of the winter break, I came back and I had a grand reopening. And I really started to teach the way I imagined that I would teach all those many years ago as a little girl. Because I took the time to read and research, to learn as much as I could so that I could be an effective teacher for my students. Now that was in the late 90s. But then in 2002, something happened something that would change the focus of education for many years to come. You see, on January 8, 2002, President George W. Bush signed into law the No Child Left Behind Act. Now, this act was meant to close the achievement gap between poor and minority students and their more affluent counterparts by increasing the federal government's role in school accountability. Now, a large component of this, as we all know, is high-stakes testing. Now, I need you to know that I'm not one of these teachers who is against testing and accountability, because I believe we are all responsible for educating our youth. So I'm not against testing. However, somewhere along the line, those who are in charge, those who, making, who are making the decisions, decided that getting a proficient score on a minimum state standards test was the only thing that mattered. You see, in a national survey, 66% of the schools that responded admitted to decreasing the amount of time in subjects such as social studies, science, art, and music, and physical education since the passing of NCLB. But see, you didn't have to tell me that because as a teacher, I lived it. As a consultant, I see the effects of it every single day. Not in all schools, of course, but in the schools that I serve, those Title I schools, those teachers are told what to teach, when to teach, how to teach it, what verbiage to use. In some cases, they are micromanaged so much down to the point where they are told exactly where on the board to write their objectives for the day. No autonomy and no belief in their professional capabilities. Who could work in a situation like that? So to those good teachers, the ones who love their kids, the ones who make no excuses, they meet their students where they are and they take them to new levels of greatness. To those who come in early and stay late every day just so they can be prepared for their kids, I wanna give a little bit of advice to you. First of all, stand up for yourself as professionals and stop doing what you know is not best for kids simply because someone told you to do it. Stop doing it. And the next time your new principal comes into your classroom, you know the one that taught for exactly three years so they can get their principal certificate? So when they come into your classroom to check and see if your objectives are indeed written on the top left-hand corner of your board, I want you to look them in the face and say to them, shut the door and come on in and see what my kids are doing today in order to change the world. Yes, I know you see this group of students here and they are drawing, and I know you told me not to do artwork, but you see, they're actually working on a cross-curricular project. They've been Skyping with a group of students in Brazil. They're working on a campaign to save the rainforest. You see, I think we should be teaching our students how to care for and take care of the environment. They need to be wondering and worrying about what legacy they're gonna leave for future generations. 
And yes, I know you see this group over here. They are doing social studies. And I know you told me not to do social studies because reading is far more important. But you see, my students learn social studies through the reading of primary sources. So therefore, they get real-world applications for reading every single day. Besides, shouldn't people know their history so that they're not bound to repeat the mistakes and atrocities of the past? And yes, that's my writing center. And I know you told me not to teach writing because kids only write in fourth and seventh grade here in Texas. But every bit of research that I've read says that writing is a great way for students to process their learning and understanding. And so when I had my kids write in their math and science classes, their achievement actually went up. After all, writing is critical thinking on paper, right? You see, Mr. or Mrs. Principal, I know that you and I are under a lot of pressure to get good scores on these state assessments. But you see, I think our far greater job is to ensure that our students never think or never feel that their only value and worth is in a number on a spreadsheet. You see, I teach. And I teach like it's a matter of life and death because for some of my kids, it very well may be. I teach. Not for some fear of a test and definitely not because you told me to. I teach because it's in my blood. And so if you and whoever else is making these crazy decisions here lately would just shut up and let me, I'll teach. Thank you.